Well, good morning, good morning. Invite those people out in the foyer to come on in and find a seat. Welcome to Mac Chap this week. Congratulations, everybody. It's a su survival of the fittest. You figured out the whole time change thing. I don't know about you, but I was a bit slow out of bed this morning. <laughs> but yeah, it's great to see you here this morning. Um, and we're going to begin our time by singing together. Let's wake ourselves up. Let's um, remind ourselves of why we're here. Uh, to sing of a God who loves us, uh, who cares for us, and who brings us together, invites us into his family. So please stand with us and sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently give me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. The lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lives like arrows miss me, I'll fix my
party, so we painted a lot of the hall. The big new wall down the end hasn't been painted yet, um, but it's almost ready. We're waiting for a plasterer to come and plaster it. Um, I now show you, um, pretend uh, on the screen, the six pictures that Sharon has taken for us of the inside of the hall. Um, but if you want more, you can always wander down and look at the inside of the hall. All the doors are now the same colour. When we started, the doors were three different colours, um, at least. And so that's good. Next thing, loving community top tip number nine is, I love the sound effects, is everyone is of immense worth. And so the encouragement for us to uh, view people that way as we build a loving community. Remember, if you've got a loving community top tip, please let me know. Uh, I'd like to be able to share it with others. But this one comes from Matthew 5.44 where Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, and so Jesus, even when it came to those who might be against us, uh, encouraged us to pray for them because Jesus died for them. Jesus has decided even your enemies uh, were of unsurpassable worth and therefore died for. And so it's part of building a loving community because sometimes as we rub up against each other's shoulders, we annoy each other. Why am I here? Good question. It's the Alpha Course. And with the Alpha course, we have some flyers in the foyer. Um, before 8.30 service, we had 13 bundles of flyers that, you, that were wrapped in a street map with streets highlighted that you could go, uh, you could deliver them to the streets. Uh, Andrew has one there for, he's holding it up so you can see. Is that the one you've taken, Andrew? You're right. And what's one of the streets you're doing, Andrew? Wolfgang? Wurang. You rang? Um, anyway, uh, and so you, you can do that. It won't have enough flyers probably for everybody in the streets that are allocated, which is why, so we've done that as a, an opportunity for you, if you like, as your letterbox dropping, if you want to take some, uh, that you can pray as you go to each letterbox and work out um, as you go along with it. God's especially uh, encouraging to put uh, them in somebody's letterbox or not. Um, and so to do it with the, uh, yeah, Go for a walk with the Holy Spirit and do that. So if you want to do that, please keep praying for Alpha. Please keep praying for who it is that you might invite as well. And if you have friends or family that you just want to take one or two flyers for, then there's some flyers that have been separated out for you to be able to do that. So please take as many as you feel uh, you might need, uh, which would be great. Cafe on the Corner is this Friday. Uh, and so please, if you could let Sharon know if you're going to be there by Wednesday um, so that she can cater for you. Thanks, Sharon. And also for DNA groups. We haven't talked about DNA groups for a little while, but just a reminder that they exist. We started them as something for the guys because we felt that the guys in our church were particularly a little bit disconnected. Uh, but there is at least one uh, ladies' DNA group running as well now, so we have overcome that gender barrier or divide that was there. We still don't, and I'm assuming we won't, have a gender-diverse one, which we have men and women at, but uh, if you are interested, DNA groups are usually three people, you could have four if you really want to, uh, who make time to meet together weekly or fortnightly or monthly. Uh, and so it's a, for a small group to be able to work around some of the intricacies of life so that they can still meet together. That's it in the way of... An, oh, oh, sorry, yes, we're going back to the photos now. So um, there's some photos and there's some more photos. Hey, and there's me. Anyway, so let's move right along. But you can see all the doors are the same colours. But that wall up the back there... We have a cream shutter coming, so all the doors are cream now, and we'll be painting that wall still. That hasn't quite happened yet, but it's a much nicer environment already for things like playtime and stuff like that and for running alpha. But also, it's, um, some people have made the comment that, gee whiz, the floor looks a little ordinary now. Uh, so when you sort of make something look nice, other things look a little worse. Um, that's right, we'll keep going. But thank you to everybody who helped with that. And also, special thanks to Ying, who provided food for for us. Okay, to Ying, who provided food for us on uh, both the nights of the paint party. Now, who am I handing over to? Oh, and they're going off. Okay, so I'm going to pray for the kids. Thanks for that, John. That was beautiful. You should do choreography. Okay, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for the kids. Pray that you'd be with them now as they head off to have a great time together, that they would learn more about your love for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can go. Run. Run. You're free. 
Walk sensibly. Who would have thunk it when I was thinking about what we'd pray about this morning and didn't know what the top tip was going to be? Turns out it's very appropriate. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was had the opportunity to be in Poland for work and um, just kind of got a sense firsthand of um, you know the whole situation in Ukraine, which is next door, and um, you know the impact it's having on uh, the community there. First obvious sign was my the, the Uber driver was Ukrainian. <laughs> Apparently a lot of Uber drivers in this town in, in Poland are now Ukrainian and it's about 20% of the population there. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, there's signs in shops. I don't know if you can read that. But it says, we're going to provide free wine and oysters when Putin's finally dead. Um, not quite along the, the theme of what Dave was encouraging us to be today, but it was just really present um, amongst the community. A bunch of the guys I was working with there some of them are Ukrainian and they're, they're reservists. Um, there's a lot of people in the, in the community at, at, at work who are directly affected by uh, the war. And obviously this week's shown us some, some pretty more challenging moves happening. So I thought, hey, let's pray. That, that's a church I got to go to on Sunday night. Um, it's a Baptist church in, in the town in Wrocław um, where I was visiting and um, there's a, a really vibrant Baptist church Polish speaking congregation in the morning and then at night there's an international church there that meet and it's you know hugely global uh, and I thought we could pray for them too they brought in a lot of people uh, when the war started in you know the March sort of time frame and were, it's actually quite a big building it's got a lot of rooms downstairs so they're actually accommodating um, people staying on site there uh, in the early days so it was just a you know a first-hand reminder um, of stuff going on and I thought hey it's good, good for us to, over here to be praying uh, for that situation. So let's, let's do that. Let's start um, with a psalm and then, yeah, let's get into it. Let's pray. God, you're our refuge and our strength. An ever-present help in trouble. And so we won't fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. You are with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. God of all peoples and nations, who created all things alive and breathing, united and whole. Show us the way of peace. That's your overwhelming presence. This morning we hold before you the people of both Ukraine and Russia, every child, every adult. And we just long for a time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares, when nations no longer lift up sword against nation. This morning we cry out to you for peace. Protect those who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and for the lives of their loved ones. We pray for our brothers and sisters um, over the other side of the world, many of whom are under huge pressure at the moment. Um, and just trying to find out, figure out how to care for those who are around them, displaced, distressed. We pray that you would give them strength um, and that you give them um, energy just to serve and to love those around them. We pray for those churches that are in those conflict regions. Um, we pray that you would give them um, protection grant them protection and also the ability to trust you, God of Jacob. We pray for all those um, adults and kids who've already been traumatised by what's happened over there, uh, for those who are struggling. We pray that you will bring healing 
that you'll heal their mental and emotional scars. We pray that they will come to know you. They'll come to know your love, even in the midst of this situation. We thank you for the areas where there has been an easing um, in conditions and um, some return to a semblance of normality. Um, we pray for, again, we just pray for um, the rebuilding in those areas and um, yeah, we, again, particularly pray for our brothers and sisters. Are you just really able to give them the ability to be activated in, that, uh, in the midst there, in the communities there, um, and have impact. Father, we pray for all the leaders involved in this situation. From Putin himself to Zelensky and, and the rest of the UN and, and as they all find their way through this situation. Father, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine um, hearts changing, but we have to trust that you are a God who can do that. Uh, and so, God, we pray that you would find a way to bring peace, that you would bring wisdom um, and courage uh, to the leaders who have... Um, yeah, the ability to make impact in this situation. We want to praise you for all the generosity that's been shown, you know, for this, this little church in Wrocław. We, we praise you for the, the generosity shown to um, people fleeing uh, Ukraine. Um, and we pray for that society as it continues to grapple with this huge influx of people. Um, we just pray that you give um, that community hearts that overflow with love um, and particularly for the churches that you would um, enable them to um, yeah, just witness your love that overflows uh, to these communities of people that just so need it right now. So God, we just pray that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that your peace would reign, now and always. We pray for our enemies, <laughs> and we pray that um, uh, they would know your love. We pray that um, we know that you are able. And so, Lord, we, we lay all these requests at your feet, because we know that you can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. Amen. Our reading today is Psalm 126. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Thanks, Rod. And um, just as we start, we're going to be going into the Lord's Supper from here. So, yeah, hopefully you've got something to eat and to drink for the Lord's Supper. Good. Now, Psalm 126 is a psalm that we're just going to deal with really briefly. We're actually going to have a bit of a look at joy itself this morning. Um, 
so as to sort of set the scene for the rest of the series, I guess. Um, but I do want to say that Psalm 126, if you look in your Bibles, if you did open an NIV Bible that's you know, in the back of a pew there, you'd know that as you flick through and look at all the Psalms beforehand, for example, from Psalm 120, it's called a Song of Ascents. Psalm 121, Song of Ascents. Psalm 122, a Song of Ascents of David. Psalm 123, a Song of Ascents. 124, a Song of Ascents of David. 125, Song of Ascents. 126, where we are, a Song of Ascents. You go to 127, a Song of Ascents of Solomon. 128, a Song of Ascents. 129, a Song of Ascents. 130, a Song of Ascents. 131, a Song of Ascents of David. It goes on and on and on. Uh, not all Psalms are Songs of Ascent, but these ones are. Now, I have spoken briefly about this before. What is a song of ascent? A song of ascent is a song or a psalm that you said on your way where? On your way up. It would be appropriate for me to do it when I get to the bottom and go up to the back of the church. Or if I lived down in Bowden Street still near the Parramatta River and came up to church, I could sing a song of ascent. I'm coming to, well, for Israel in particular, for David, for Solomon, for the people who are singing these, They were coming to the temple. The temple was up on the mount. And so they would come up and it would be a song of ascent. And so this is a song of joy because we're coming to be with God. And that's something to be joyful about. So this is one of those. Um, And so wouldn't, if you're going to look for joy in the Psalms, a song of ascent would make sense, wouldn't it? Um, But what I want to do is start by thinking a little bit about where joy comes from in particular. Uh, We get this from a number of different places, but I hope that we've just come out of 1 John and there's these a couple of words in John that start with L. Um, One rhymes with right, I'm not thinking about that one. One rhymes with dove, it's love. Do you remember? And do, do you remember where we sort of grow in love and how we grow in love? We do that by coming to the God who is love. But it's not just true for love, it's true for other things. How do I become somebody who is more grace-filled and has grace in my life? By coming to the God who is the God of grace, who shows me grace. He says, hey Dave, this is how you do it. And teaches me, um, how do I, you know, and we've actually looked at this with forgiveness, how do I grow in my ability to forgive? You come to the God who has forgiven you. Um, But it's not just those sort of love, grace, forgiveness Do you know where you go to find joy? God. (laughs) Okay. A little bit to look at this morning. And so Isaiah says this. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. This is the God of joy. He takes delight and joy in you, which is pretty amazing. And so the God who takes joy or delight in us is also, according to Nehemiah 8.10, the one who will give us joy that will actually be our strength. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Uh, So joy is something that comes from God. It's been said of God that he is the most joyful being in the universe. Do we often think of, sometimes we think of him as the most loving being, but also think of him as maybe a little bit tired, a bit jaded sometimes maybe a little cranky, a bit grumpy, but he's actually the God from whom joy comes. Uh, He's made us in his image, and he is a God of many things, but joy is one of them. In John 17, 13, we actually see this um, in Jesus. Now, we're going to come to the Lord's table in a little while, and as we do that, it's fitting to look at some words by Jesus during that last supper that he had and we're going to think about it a bit this morning but initially just look at what uh, some of what Jesus says in that final discourse with his disciples says I'm coming to you now but I say these things while I am still in the world so that you may know the full measure he says of my joy and you might know it within you that they might know it within them So Jesus has a joy within him which he wants us to have in some way. Now, we've seen God is a God of joy. We've seen his son, Jesus, is um, somebody who has joy and has it um, and wants other people to have the full measure of his joy. 
Uh, but then there's the Holy Spirit as well. Let's just go Trinitarian for a second. And we've got in Galatians 5 a list of the fruits of the Spirit as the Spirit works in and through us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's the second cab off the rank? Joy. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, patience, uh, faithfulness, sorry, gentleness, and self-control. Joy is one of those things that apparently if we're connected to God in an intimate way is going to come through in our lives and be fruit in our lives. So my first point is that God is joyful. Uh, he is the place uh, that we find joy. And this Holy Spirit has joy that can be ours too. Now you may not be feeling joyful this morning. That's okay. But let's have a little bit of a think, a deeper think as to what joy actually is. Now, if you look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and I've got one of these, um, it's in my office there, and I love putting it in the shelf because it's the unabridged one. It's nearly as wide as it is high, and the shelf sags. I've noticed the shelf is sagging in there. Um, I should, probably shouldn't put it in the middle, but I like to watch the shelf sag. Anyway, uh, I love Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Um, it's a bit of an old dictionary, and this is the definition it has for joy. Uh, it's got three parts. Uh, the emotion evoked by well-being, success or good fortune or by the prospect of possessing what one desires, delight. Secondly, the expression or exhibition of such emotion, gaiety. It's an old dictionary. And finally, a state of happiness or felicity, bliss. Now, just for a moment, I love Merriam-Webster's dictionary, but I just want to say this is a pretty, I guess, it set the bar a little bit low with joy in a sense. In fact, if you were to look up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary happiness, or what, yeah, happiness, one of the synonyms it gives for happiness is joy. It actually equates the two. Now, there's a way in which in day-to-day -day life we do use them interchangeably, don't we? Uh, if we're just talking about joy in a very general sense, and we talk about happiness in a general sense, then we could see them as the same thing. But I don't think they are. I want to challenge us with that thought this morning. Uh, I want to do that by quoting a good friend of mine. Actually, I don't never met the guy, but love quoting him, Henry Nouwen. He says, joy is not the same as happiness. Take that, Merriam-Webster. He says, we can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. Remember where joy comes from? It comes from God. And so even in spite of situations where we might be unhappy indeed, joy can exist. There is this idea that joy has a greater depth to it and more substance to it. It's anchored in something greater than happiness. Happiness is often something that is anchored in maybe a lack of hard times. There's nothing bad happening in life and so I am happy. Did you notice the definition that Merriam-Webster Merriam -Webster gives? is this idea that even, so to look at the first one, good fortune or the prospect of possessing what one desires. In other words, oh wow, I got something I wanted. I got a pony. I prayed for a pony once, didn't get it. But if I had, maybe I would have been happy. But maybe God didn't want me to have a pony because he didn't want me to be happy. He wanted me to have something more because he sought something greater for me, something like joy. Um, there's this... Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to talk about a guy who uh, is a dodgy guy. So just saying that, he's a dodgy guy, but I like some of the things he says. A uh, guy by the name of Rob Bell. Uh, that's right, works with Oprah now. He's got a video. You can Google it if you want. It goes for over an hour. Um, he's got a website and I think you'll find it on his website and you can watch it. And it's called An Introduction to Joy. Um, anyone see An Introduction to Joy? No, okay. It's worth having a look at. It's a challenging sort of thing. But one of the things he talks about is how happiness has a... Uh, and a naivety to it. Um, happiness is something that is a lightness, but it's not a lightness with a substance. He said life can often start with that lightness, but then we, things in life can cause a heaviness to come in, a dark night of the soul, a hitting of the wall, or whatever it is, things that we've looked at in the past here at MacChat. And with that, he says, you can come from that lightness into that heaviness, but he said, you can then find a lightness on the other side of that heaviness. And he said, that's where joy sits. And notice how joy sits on the other side of that heaviness, or even you find it in that heaviness. Uh, 
And so Rob Bell says this, um, this is a, a quote from the video. He says, there is some sort of lightness on the other side, the other side of that heaviness. He says, this is why joy is not threatened by pain, loss, angst, betrayal. Joy wraps its arms around the full spectrum of the human experience. Joy never denies, it never represses, it never avoids, because joy has seen it all. And yet it's still found something there to rejoice in. Like I said, this is a heavy talk on joy. It's not lightness and rainbows and lollipops. It is asking us to think a little bit deeper as we enter into four weeks of thinking about joy. And so we come to Psalm 126 just for a moment. In the first two verses, we get a picture of this. It says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, our tongues were filled with songs of joy. Um, there is this picture that it was not just life has always been fine and dandy for God's people, and it always will be, so therefore we have joy. No, no, no. Did you notice? When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. There's actually been a really hard time. And this is still a song of a sense. It's a song of a sense as they come up to the temple, but it's a recognition that there have been some who were in exile who were no longer with us. It's actually... There's a deep sadness and grieving and loss in this psalm of joy. Even if it's only a glimmer of it. And notice that God is somehow the source of the joy because he finds a way for them through that heaviness to the other side. In verse 3 it says, The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. God has not let us down. It's been a rough season, but God is still here and still very much at work. And so there's great things that God has done, but it's in the context coming out of, at least, of great suffering. Uh, do you know the first poem or song of joy in Scripture? It's the very first one. And so because of the context of it, I'm thinking it's the first one ever. It's in the second chapter of Genesis, so it's really, really close to the beginning. And what happens, right? God makes a guy called Adam, but Adam's alone. And that's bad. God actually recognises, it says in Genesis 2, that God saw that it was not good. And so Adam's actually, you think, hey, there hasn't been the fall, there's no disease, everything's going well, it's pre-fall. Adam should be happy, but he's not. There's something profoundly wrong with his situation. And so what does God do about it? Hey, let's not jump to Eve yet because he does something else before. Almost as though God is sort of like trying to underline to Adam just how bad it is. He brings all the animals before him. And he says, you name them and maybe we'll find a suitable helper for you through them. A helper being somebody to help you with your loneliness. In other words, a suitable companion for you. And so uh, God brings the hippopotamus before, um, before Adam, and Adam goes, well, what am I going to do with one of those? But let's call it a hippopotamus. Uh, he brings these animals, and the other thing to notice is that he's created them male and female, so he brings them before Adam, male and female. And every single time, Adam's going, look, it's, that's fine, it's a female hippopotamus. That's great for Mr. Hippopotamus, but I'm Mr. Man and Mrs. Hippopotamus is not going to do it for me. Can you see how God is underlining that the, you are lacking something here? And so they go through all the animals and they get to the dog and Adam's like, oh, that's, that's close. And then God realises, and I think Adam realises, there's just no one out there for me. Can you hear the loneliness? And then God puts Adam to sleep, takes a part of Adam, forms Eve, brings Eve, and then we have the first, I believe, poem of joy or song of joy where Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She's going to be called woman for she is taken out of man. Uh, what the literal translation is not, she shall be called woman, but rather, this is a female man. Can you hear? This is not a female hippopotamus. This is a female man. And so there's joy. But where did the joy come from? 
You see, at this point still, there has been no fall. There's been no sin. There's been no selfishness. There hasn't been any of that. And even in that, there is an emptiness for a period. An aloneness. And joy comes from coming to the other side. And how is it that Adam gets to the other side? Because of what God has done. It's an interesting picture, isn't it? Joy often is born out of not good situations, as God does something. Henry now said this, uh, which is quite profound. He says, when we think about some of our deepest life experiences, such as being present at the birth of a child or the death of a friend, great sorrow and great joy are often seen as parts of the same experience. I don't know what it was at the birth of our children, but something was deeply emotional. It wasn't just joy. There was something else quite significant at that event. But the other thing, and I said this to 8.30, because 8.30 service have gone through a season this year, a really hard time this year, of many funerals at 8.30. And... And I said to them, how do you know it's been a good funeral? And I could see people nodding, because they know. At a good funeral, people cry, people mourn. At a good funeral, people laugh as well. There is joy at a good funeral. As you remember some of those, you know, quirks of that person, some of the ridiculous things that they did, uh, some of the things that they were obsessed with, some of the things that made them unique... And you have a smile or a laugh when you remember that about that person, even though there's great sorrow. And so Henry uh, encourages us with this idea that there's great sorrow and great joy often seen in the same experience. And note that that's not the thing about happiness. Happiness is usually seen as where there's a lack of great sorrow. Indeed, it's because of the lack of great sorrow that we can be happy. I remember when I used to go into um, uh, Macquarie University each week and we would spend an hour um, doing, I guess, walk-up evangelism, just talking to people about Jesus. And the way that we did that was we would say, hey, I'm from, we're from a Christian group on campus and we've got a survey. Would you like to fill in a survey? Now, you might think, well, no one's going to say, yeah, I want to fill in a survey. But when you're a uni student and you want something to procrastinate from the uni work that you're doing, survey, yes, please. And so they, you know, I think, you know, the whole time I did it, maybe one or two people said, no, thanks. And one of the first questions is, what is it that you want out of life? And do you want the number one answer for Macquarie University students with regards to what they want out of life? They want to be happy. They want to be happy. They don't want to experience sadness. They don't want things to roadblock them. They want an easy career path. They want to uh, be able to date and marry or find a partner for life without any hurts or breakups. They want to be happy. It's like, seriously, guys, do you know what planet you're living on? This isn't happy town. Very rarely does a student say, well, I'd like some deep, weighty experiences so that I really appreciate the great things. Now, one of the things Rob Bell does in his talk on an introduction to joy is he talks, he uses Ecclesiastes. And what's that, that phrase that occurs in Ecclesiastes over and over again? He says, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And, and Rob Bell explains it's vapor. He actually has a squirty bottle that that squirts this vapour and he's going around the stage going, Psh, it's just vapour, baby. He's really cool. It's vapour. It's just vapour management. That's what it's all about. And then the writer of Ecclesiastes says, and so if you can find something in life that is worth your time, enjoy it. Because there's a meaningless to everything. It was not just, we're not just put here to be happy. There's something else. There's something deeper. So, Henry would encourage us with regards to how we feel about some of those hard times in life. Uh, and indeed, he points us 
to, I guess, for himself, uh, the difference that those hard times sometimes made. He said, I remember the most painful times of my life as times in which I became aware of a spiritual reality much larger than myself. My grief was the place where I found my joy. In a hard time, in a hard place, sometimes we start to dig deeper. Sometimes we discover that God, the God who is the God of joy, is actually there in the midst of all of that. Sadly, we don't always find that, do we? Well, I want to finish with just talking about one thing that I think joy needs. It's really important. Because really, I've just told you so far, you know, go out and just make a mess of your life so you can find joy. Um, It's not what I want to say. There's something else. There's another ingredient which I think is helpful to joy. And we even see it uh, in our psalm. Yes, we are talking on Psalm 126 this morning in verse 6. Notice what it says. You might miss it if it wasn't pointed out. It says, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Can you see what's happened? (laughs) These guys are in a really hard place. They're weeping. They're going through some sort of grief, some sort of pain. Um, The context is possibly because some of them are not there. Uh, They're in captivity. Uh, They've been taken away. Um, And it says they, they go out, and they go out, and they're crying in their grief. But notice that they haven't given up. They have a hope. And so they have a hope, so they carry seed with them. And the purpose of the seed is to plant the seed. Why do they want to plant seed? Because they have a hope. They have a hope that this current situation that is causing them much grief and pain is not the end of it all. And so they carry seed to sow. They haven't given up. Why? Because they have a hope. It says those people who do that, even though they weep and they mourn and they are in a hard place and have this hope and therefore have seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, doing what? Carrying sheaves with them. (laughs) That hope has been planted. That hope has germinated. That hope has sprung up. That hope is born fruit. And they come back with songs of joy. Henry Nouwen, I hope you're not Henry Nouwen out yet. He says, there is an intimate relationship between joy and hope. While optimism makes us live as if someday soon things will get better for us, hope frees us from the need to predict the future and allows us to live in the present with the deep trust that God will never leave us alone, but will fulfill the deepest desires of our heart. Joy, in this perspective, is the fruit of hope. And so this idea that we don't just, I guess, optimistic that things might get better next week or the week after but rather in our situation right now we actually hold on to no matter how bad our situation right on is right now is that there is a reason for joy because even in this God has not let us go and so James (laughs) makes this statement in his letter doesn't he have you ever raised an eyebrow at this consider it pure joy my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds It's a ridiculous statement, is it not? Notice he didn't say, consider it pure happiness. Because happiness is too naive to be able to understand this statement. But rather consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because James knows there's a hope. (laughs) The reason you are facing trials is because you believe in the one who has saved you and who holds you and walks with you in whatever it is you're going through. Or Hebrews can say this about Jesus. Have a look at this, and we're coming to his table in a moment, to the table of our Saviour Jesus. He says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, for a moment, we might think, Jesus, his joy was just on the other side of the cross, and yet it would appear that we get glimmers of joy in Jesus as he comes to the cross. Why? Because he has a hope 
a sure hope. It's not going to end with the cross. And so he finds joy in his present suffering in some way. And that hope is that he would be sat down on the right hand of the throne of God, that there was another side to the cross. There was a lighter side on the other side. And the reason I say that I think we get glimmers of hope in some way, even before the cross and leading up to the cross, is the Last Supper and some of the things Jesus says, such as at the Last Supper, as I said before, he, he says, he talks about his joy and wanting the fullness of full measure of his joy um, to be in his disciples and those uh, who might hear of him and believe in him. He talks about joy, but there's another place as well as we come to the table. And you might have slipped past it, but there is a thankfulness in Jesus, even in that Last Supper. You remember the Last Supper? You know, where he got his closest mates? And he said, one of you is going to betray me. And he says to all the others, and you're all going to leave me. You remember that Last Supper? And yet, what does Jesus say? He points to a hope, doesn't he? He says, one day, I'm going to drink this again. There's joy for Jesus in that moment. One day, I'm going to drink this again. But next time, oh, next time, I'll be in my Father's kingdom, he says. But, but there's the other little snippet as well. And I should move on. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. Now, you have probably been like me and you thought, okay, so Jesus took the cup and he said, Lord, for what we're about to receive, may you make us truly thankful. He said, grace. That's what you think, is it? I don't know. Somehow in that, even as he's saying, I'm going to die, my blood's going to be poured out, my body's going to be broken, he gives thanks and then shares the bread. He gives, he gives thanks. Now, it never in the text says he gave thanks for the bread. <laughs> Just that he gave thanks. What did he give thanks for? Well, maybe he did give thanks for the bread. But he was thankful <laughs> Even in that situation, as he comes to the place of giving himself up for those he loves, he gives, he gives thanks. Why would he do that? It's because I think of something that we've been looking at through 1 John, that idea of love. When we ascribe unsurpassable worth to others at necessary cost to ourselves, Jesus looks at the cross as a source of joy. <laughs> because at the cross, he will pay the price that he is more than willing to pay for you and for me, because he delights in us. He has joy in us. And so the cross becomes this small price on the path to joy. It becomes a part of his joy in that way. It's challenging, isn't it? <laughs> it's so easy in life to see the hard things that we go through. It's so easy as a parent sometimes, isn't it, to have the joy of parenting taken away as we put up with things from our kids or friendships or work or whatever it might be. Jesus can help reorient that perspective for us, can't he? And so I want to invite you into an exercise this week. And I had a look at some spiritual practices for joy as I was thinking about how to end. And this is a little diversion before we come to his table uh, in a moment. But one of them was to, it had two parts. It was to journal about something that you were thankful for. Uh, but then there was a second part to it. And I actually wanted, it, because of the nature of the talk this morning, to just invite you into the second part. But feel free to do the first part. You can probably guess what it might involve. Um, but if you want more details, you can always see me afterwards. But this is the second part. 
it's a journaling exercise, and you know, it may not be a journaler, but it might still help to do it even without journaling to just sit with these questions. But there's a series of, well, not questions, but they're statements. And the idea is to journal about something that you are struggling with at this time to slow down and hear from God and receive his validation in your struggle. And so write what you hear God say to you with the following. And so these are sort of some beginnings of some sentences and just sit with the beginning and see what comes to you as you journal as to what God might say to you. The first one is, I see you, and the second one is very similar, it is, I hear you. So to sit with those two statements for some time throughout this week and to journal the response. Sometimes it's helpful in whatever situation we are in to realise that God can see us and can hear us. It may provide some comfort. I can understand how hard this is for you, dot, 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 is the third statement. What is it that God might say to you with regards to how he understands how hard it is for you? Remember that he is the father who sent his son to die on a cross. He has some understanding of hard things. Uh, the next one is, I am glad to be with you and treat your weaknesses tenderly. This is the God who loves us with a loving kindness with a gentleness and then finally I can do something about what you are going through dot 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 maybe to sit with God and hear what he might say in the midst of this now this may not for you immediately cause you to spring up from your journal with joy filled heart but it may bring some comfort it may bring some hope it may remind you and reorient you. Allow God to speak to you through the process of journaling. Don't be in a hurry to fill in what he might say on his behalf, but rather wait for him and see what prompting comes. If something doesn't come, then leave it and go to the next one. But perhaps this will bring comfort, perhaps it will bring some hope that might, over time, turn to joy for you. But right now we have the opportunity to come to the table. I want to encourage you, if you've got something to eat or something to drink, this is a place where God shows his grace and how much he values you and me. It's a table that is not restricted by Jesus when he set it up and invited those who were going to betray him and leave him. Um, at a particular time in his journey that would be hard. Rather, he invited them all. And so you too are invited this morning. And we do this to remember what he has done, which he has done because he has valued us. So I invite you to take, eat, remember that Christ's body was broken for you, and be joyful. As I said, Jesus um, said on the, the last supper on the night he was betrayed, he said, I will not drink this cup again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So I invite you to take, to drink, to remember that Christ's blood was poured out for you and to be filled with joy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness and your love. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for the value that you have placed upon us. We thank you that you delight in us, that we are a source of joy for you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, often when we pause after a sermon, we have a more reflective song, but not today. No. Today, it's time to um, sing with joy, right? <laughs> Thanks, Dave, um, for setting us up for these next four weeks. And um, this first song says, You've been faithful through every storm. And you'll be faithful forevermore. And so in the moments of those hard, hard times, we can remember the faithful God who's with us through that. Uh, and that's a reason to sing and to celebrate. So I'm going to invite you to stand and join with us as we sing.
let's continue on in praise. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the steadfast love, a God of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in grace. As we walk out of this place this morning, fill us with a hope and a trust in you that even in those dark nights, you are there and that you love us and that you will bring us through. And so in that, make us people of joy. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Please do hang around and um, get to know each other. Uh, Enjoy some morning tea together. We'll see you next week.